Let's hear it, Mia Ritter. What if I told you in 2022, there were 89 cattle deceased on the Tohono O'odham Nation reservation land rotting for weeks from a drought? What if I told you this wasn't the first time? What if I told you this was a common situation that happens among so much more reservation land? I come from the indigenous tribe, the Tohono O'odham Nation of Arizona. My reservation is in the south, and for those of you that aren't too familiar with the state, especially the southern part, um, in cells near about Tucson, Arizona, about an hour away, um, imagine yourself in 115 degrees of heat, and you are denied water. There isn't enough water for the cattle. There isn't enough for you. I'm in my last year of my undergrad studying animal sciences within the College of Agricultural Sciences, and I'm in a pre-veterinary track at Colorado State University. I'm my first person from my tribe to study at a university in Colorado. I grew up off reservation um, with my single mom and two siblings. So yes, we were on low income, but we were a lot better off not on a reservation. The way reservations work is there's an allocation of land that is given to indigenous people, but it's not the original land that we were settled in. It's where the government placed them. Our laws and policies are a lot different significantly at a national level versus within the uh, reservation land. So our agriculture and farming policies, water laws, load shedding, and just everything else is in control within the state. On many reservations, including mine, we get a chunk of income from most of our agriculture production and importation, which is about 81% that is towards revenue for public people within a national level, and the rest goes towards the people um, in the land. With a low water supply, our tribe faced one of the biggest droughts last year, and the majority of our livestock, 89 cattle included, including other livestock, died from dehydration. The lack of resources is incredibly high. The low supply of foods making them expensive, where grapes will cost you $20, or bread will cost you $15, or like you see here, a case of grapes will cost you about $14 to $15. A case of water will be $36 to $37 for a pack. Um, and we have a healthcare system, IHS, which is also known as uh, Indian Health Services, which is what we use for uh, our healthcare system, and it's a very poor system. I like to compare this to the DMV, but a lot worse, and a lot longer, and worse conditions. Um, so it's a bit rough, and um, all Native use this in order to get proper healthcare. I think a lot about my relatives and how my community didn't get to graduate high school. A lot of people don't. And maybe some got their GEDs, but most commonly, there really aren't a lot of people that go to college, just like me, um, which I am here now. <laughs> and because of the lack of good education we get from reservations and the systematic oppression that we have to face, we have to, that we need to thrive. We don't get those resources that we need to thrive to um, that has tried to erase us within the past. My mother, she decided my home is not sustainable for my family anymore. And she took as far from her life as a child and as far away from our reservation as possible to give us somewhat better lives. This systematic oppression has uprooted our people off reservation and to escape its environment, but it's not easy for everyone. There are more people that live off reservation than there are indigenous people that live within the land. This creates a target for lands to be taken by the government and more tribes to be erased more and more and created as history. This has created an emptiness within our communities. In a single parent household was hard financially, but it was full of so much love that none of that really mattered. And I got so much love from my siblings, my brother and my sister, and it was so beautiful. When we were kids, we were sent, when we were sent any kind of birthday money or any kind of gifts, we would give it to our mother to help with bills to keep us housed. 
And we were too young to understand anything that was going on, but like I said, none of it mattered because we understood the struggle, and it was difficult financially sometimes. But she gave us such a great life, and from the love that we had for one another, I will forever be grateful for that and always remember. My education up until I was 18 wasn't the best public education. However, I made the most of it and excelled at all of my academics. And leaving my family, which is all that I've ever known, was one of the biggest things I've had to do in my life and one of the hardest things I've ever had to face. Leaving everything behind to become a doctor at CSU, it was all I ever dreamed of. And never did I think it was a possibility, but I left so that I can chase my dreams. And that's what's hard about Native people, Indigenous people leaving their homes and their reservations. It seems impossible until it happens, and it feels like the biggest heartbreak that you'll ever feel in the world, leaving everything behind, leaving everything that you've ever known to go where you want to go. It feels impossible because in your head, all you ever hear is, you'll never succeed, you won't fit in, and you can't do this. And we constantly compare ourselves to our peers. And a lot of us, we never had perfect families. We never had the best financial systems to succeed. We never had the best, maybe, medical attention and, you know, just anything else, you know, we could ever think of. Um, you know, we didn't have the same things that everyone else did. However, being a Native woman at CSU is scary because there are many of us and there's such a small population of us. And it's so tiny, and we always find ourselves in a lower advantage than others personally and academi academically and anything else that you can name. But we persevere, and we endure so much. If it weren't for my mother, my mentors, my friends, and just anyone else, I would not be where I am at CSU today. I've gotten a lot of really amazing opportunities connecting with so many of my professors within the College of Agricultural Sciences, um, just like working at RDEC, which is the Agricultural Research Development Education Center. And this is something that I've gotten to be a part of for four years now. There we study the digestion of nutrients, and we decide, um, you know, the feeds that we provide for our fistulated steer, and how that impacts the production in livestock that feeds Fort Collins. Working with Dr. Terry Engel, which is one of the many amazing professors, um, he's an amazing mentor and guide at CSU that I've gotten to work with, and he has made me feel included in everything, and ju that's just something that he does. He loves everyone, he makes everyone feel like you're a part of the family, even if he has no idea who you are, he will just love you the same. And that's just something I've experienced a lot within the College of Agricultural Sciences, you know, working with all these professors in animal sciences, um, especially professors like Dr. Noah Ramon Muniz, uh, Dr. Sean Archibek, um, Ms. Stephanie Lebstock. And these professors, and especially my advisors, have shaped me so much to be who I am today and have given me so much confidence and have just taught me to be so proud of myself and to be powerful and to endure through everything. They've taught me so much, and I wish I could do another TED Talk to just talk about how amazing they are, because they really are. And I've you know, had just such a great experience with my, my time at CSU, connecting with so many mentors in general. Without any of them, I would be completely different and maybe super shy or extremely scared to you know, do anything. They have given me so many connections outside of CSU community, and they thought I would be very successful in. They encouraged me to do so much to push myself outside of my comfort zone and to do research even internationally. So I thought, why don't I give it a shot? <laughs> One of the many countries I got to travel to working in Thailand, which is uh, the Elephant Nature Park. It's a rehabilitation center in Chiang Mai. And there I discovered the laws and policies are extremely different from where we are. Um, so an example is, you know, anyone in the country can own their, elephant, own their own elephant and do whatever they want with it. And the unfortunate reality is with these elephants, uh, a lot of them come from abusive um, tourists, private tourists. Um, and, you know, they use bull hooks, they use nails to pinch their ears. And so just so many different things that they do with these animals, they can do whatever they want with their owners, and um, 
you know, with this facility, we traveled around the country just rescuing all these animals. Um, I worked at this elephant uh, rehabilitation center for a while, and we worked with uh, a place that also took in hundreds, hundreds of dogs, cats, livestock, horses, etc., that were abandoned, that Lake Shaler took in. It was so beautiful there. The nature of the jungles were so rich. It was so green, super humid. At this center, I worked with this amazing woman, Lake Shaler, like I said. She started this foundation, and you know, she gave up so much just to start this facility, to take in all these animals, to follow her own dreams, to save as many animals within the country as possible, um, including with her own family, disowning her. Um, you know, I got to work with such an amazing facility that she started, like I said, where we traveled around the country just saving so many animals. Similarly, I had the opportunity to work as a volunteer in Costa Rica. And there we worked with sea turtle research and conservation, sitting on a boat every day, evaluating the species um, in the Osa Peninsula, researching these sea turtles, and seeing how they evolve through time with this computer system that a lot of the researchers and scientists use to track these animals to see how they're doing within the environment. With the way that people are living and treating the lands, in the sea turtle population, we discovered that their population is rapidly declining and potentially to go extinct within 20 to 40 years. And so our next generations will only read about sea turtles in books, and this is just a common situation that is not just within the species, but so many others. This has a lot to do with the policies that are in place or are in place to protect these animals. And there are issues that the governments need to focus on to preserve these animals and species. There are so many things that I've learned working with richer or poorer areas um, that help so many animals, and you know we can only work with the resources that we have. There has been an incredible this has been an incredible opportunity because I've gotten to learn and work in veterinary medicine in uh, so many perspectives, in so many ways, pharmaceutically, procedurally, surgically, and just so much more. I believe there needs to be a significant change in order for the better of our people and land and animals. And so something I like to ask people is, how are we educating others to uh, teach conservation? How are we educating others with what our conservation is like within our own reservations, what, whether that's anywhere within our own lands that we are around and you know, serving our communities? There must be equality for all living things on Earth. We all must protect and protest so that with whatever we have left and everything that we can do in our capability to help our communities. We can't fix the world, but we can fix as much as we can with what we're capable of. I know in my heart, I can with my education, and I want to fight for the rest of my life to preserve our land, our animals, and our communities for the rest of my life. There's an emptiness within my community that I want to go back and fill. I want to bring back opulence to my people. I want to be that essence that brings my community with everything that we need to thrive. I want to be that water that fills our dry community and our empty community with prosperity. I want to fill our empty veterinary office that we have with my education that I have to fill with my essence. My ancestors gave me my why. And for me to have these opportunities in my life to preserve our lands, and I will fight for the rest of my life to bring back what our communities need. Something that I want to close this off with is um, I grew up with my mother, you know, telling me stories about this woman, Jane Goodall. Uh, and she's a super important woman that has taught me so much within my life. And, you know, she would tell me about all these uh, book reports she would do about her and how, uh, what she did to teach others about conservation and saving our lands. Uh, for those of you that aren't familiar with Jane Goodall, she's a primatologist and anthropologist and a person who has overall made a huge impact in conservation. And she inspires me so much. And here's a quote that I think about every day. What you do makes a difference and you have to decide what kind of difference you want to make in your life. Thank you.